This talk is about how to test for open-ended evolution. To be more specific, it presents a procedure for testing for Tokyo Type 1 open-ended evolution, draft edition. My initial aim for this work was to better establish tests for open-ended evolution by drawing out and building on previous work. In the process of doing that, I realized it helped to better identify key challenges in open-ended evolution, and maybe to take a step towards a more unified view. Let's start on firm ground. So while there are a range of opinions about what underlying mechanisms may be necessary or sufficient for a system to exhibit open-ended evolution, there is something close to a consensus about the observable behavioral hallmarks of open-ended evolution. In large part, this consensus was reached at the first workshop on open-ended evolution in York and through the collective writing of the report that followed it. That gave us the York categories of open-ended evolution. The first of these relates to the ongoing generation of adaptive novelty, with subcategories for new adaptations and new kinds of entities, as well as major transitions and the evolution of evolvability. The second York category relates to the ongoing growth of complexity, Following the third workshop, which was in Tokyo, major transitions and the evolution of evolvability were separated out, recognizing them as being somewhat distinct. The remaining York types were merged into Tokyo Type 1 Open in Evolution. So within Tokyo Type 1 Open in Evolution, we have both the ongoing generation of adaptive novelty and the ongoing growth of complexity. Open ended evolution can be studied in nature, in systems with ongoing human intervention, and in autonomous artificial systems, that is, systems with no ongoing human or other external intervention. In the context of the latter kind, Tokyo Type 1 Open End Evolution is considered by me at least as a necessary foundation for Types 2, 3 and 4. It's difficult to conceive of an autonomous system achieving Tokyo Type 2 Open End Evolution, that's the ongoing generation of evolution of evolvability, or Type 3, that's ongoing generation of major transitions, without first achieving Tokyo Type 1 open in evolution. So the construction and testing of autonomous artificial systems to achieve Type 1 open in evolution is the most immediate challenge. At least that's the case for open-ended evolution research in autonomous artificial systems, that latter kind. In the other kinds, nature, the global economy and so on, we can already study open-ended evolution beyond Type 1 by taking advantage of nature having already achieved Types 1, 2, 3 and 4. So, having established the importance of testing for Tokyo Type 1 Open End Evolution, how can we do it? Well, in my paper, I brought together five methods of analysis to form a procedure for testing for Tokyo Type 1 OE. First, evolutionary activity statistics from Beddoe, Snyder, Brown and Picard. Second, my contribution to those, called component normalized evolutionary activity statistics. Third, the long-term evolutionary dynamics classification from Beddoe, Snyder and Picard. Fourth, analysis of indefinite scalability in diversity and complexity, with indefinite scalability being an idea from Ackley and my contribution being to establish how to use that for analysis, and fifth, analysis of the order of indefinite scalability. The procedure involves proceeding through these five steps sequentially. I've tried to present it as simply as possible, isolated from any complexities of a, a particular evolutionary system, and with a clear rationale for each step. Let's get started with step one, computing basic evolutionary activity statistics. At the core of open-ended evolution is the ongoing evolution of adaptive novelty. That's your type one open-ended evolution. In Beddoe, Snyder and Picard's words, new components flowing into the system and proving their adaptive value through their persistent activity. So we have this idea of persistence being crucial. A component could be, for example, a gene, an organism or a species. However, an evolutionary process could continue to generate adaptive novelty, but lose what has previously been evolved at the same or a faster rate, cycling or idling with a limited extent of adaptive success. So if we just had ongoing adaptive novelty alone, it would be a poor definition of open-ended evolution. A trivial system could generate ever more novel components. Ongoing progress and unbounded accumulation of adaptive success is also core. Cool. Evolutionary activity statistics provide a measure of exactly that. Using Beddo, Snyder and Picard's words, a measure of the continual adaptive success of the components in the system, based again on adaptive persistence. 
To make that more concrete, a component's activity is a measure of its accumulation of adaptive success. Specifically, it's the length of time that component has existed, discounting any periods of absence. So if we have a, a delta value for every component, which is 1 if the component exists at time t, 0 otherwise, we just add that up over time to get the activity of the component if it currently exists, and the activity of the component would be set to 0 if the component doesn't currently exist. We can add those up over the entire system to get the total activity within the system. That's all there is to know to compute these basic evolutionary activity statistics. They can be computed for any evolving system with an available record of its components' existent times, so are widely applicable across artificial and natural systems. In step 1, these evolutionary activity statistics are computed and a quick check performed to see whether or not total activity is bounded. If it is, there is no potential for a classification of unbounded evolutionary activity in step 3, and so the procedure ends. One of the most concrete results in open-ended evolution is that the biosphere and only a very small number of autonomous artificial systems have demonstrated unbounded total activity, even before normalization using a shadow, which I'll cover in a bit. This gives us our first challenge, developing and demonstrating more autonomous systems that exhibit unbounded total cumulative evolutionary activity. Fortunately, the effort required to evaluate a system to this extent is low, given that no random selection shadow model is required for this first step. Following success at step 1, we do now require in step 2 the implementation of a shadow model, a population and a system, that is identical to the real evolutionary system, running in parallel, except that whenever selection operates in the real system, random selection should be employed in the shadow. We also need to reset the shadow system's components and activity history to those of the real run immediately after each snapshot, which is when an entry is made in the component record. Together, these provide the data required for the computation of component normalized evolutionary activity statistics. Specifically, they enable comparison of inter-snapshot changes in activity in the real run with changes we would expect from neutral random selection. Let's see the detail of this. It's really very simple. The shadow is used to normalize, that is, exclude non-adaptive evolutionary activity at the component level, hence the name component activity normalization giving a measure of each component's adaptive evolutionary activity. So, we have a delta for the real system, a delta for the shadow system, each of which is 1 if the component exists in that system, otherwise 0. We subtract 1 from the other and add up over time to get our measure of adaptive activity for the component. That's already a really neat thing. We can use this to see how adaptive any component in the system is. For example, how adaptive a gene is. We can also use those normalized component activities to very straightforwardly calculate the component normalized, that is, adaptive measures of total, mean, and median evolutionary activity in the system. Thanks to the observation that the distribution of activities for non-adaptive components will be symmetric about zero, we also have a very simple way of measuring ongoing adaptive novelty, which is given here. Back in 2005, Stout and Spectre attempted to break the original and enhanced classification schemes, uh, the latter using the component normalized activity statistics that I've just described, and their classification schemes uh, being covered in step 3 below, uh, by achieving a classification of unbounded dynamics in intuitive and lifelike systems. They concluded that component activity normalization is of particular importance to the scheme's robustness, cancelling out the potential for spurious results arising from the random divergence of the real and shadow populations. So, for artificial systems, Stout and Spectre's findings support the argument for employing component activity normalization. After determining long-term trends in component normalized evolutionary activity statistics, the system's evolutionary dynamics can be classified according to Beddoe, Snyder and Picard's 1998 scheme. The hallmark of unbounded evolutionary dynamics is ongoing positive new evolutionary activity in combination with unbounded total and median cumulative evolutionary activity. A classification of unbounded evolutionary dynamics using component normalized evolutionary activity statistics provides a test for York type 1a open-ended evolution without ruling out other types. Only one autonomous artificial system has demonstrated this. That leads us to our second challenge, developing more autonomous systems that achieve this classification. 
Further, although we already have one autonomous artificial system at this level, it lacks behavioural transparency, preventing the direct observation of artefacts and behaviours far beyond the early stages of evolution. That leads to our third challenge. The development of the first autonomous artificial system to demonstrate unbounded evolutionary dynamics using component normalised evolutionary activity statistics and in which long evolutionary sequences of evolved artefacts or behaviours and the evolution of more complex artefacts and behaviours can be seen, evidenced by phenotypes rather than just by metrics. If an evolutionary system exhibits unbounded evolutionary dynamics in step 3, it would be natural to want to know whether or not it also exhibits ongoing growth in maximum individual complexity, i.e. York type 2 open-ended evolution. The diversity of components in an individual is one measure of its complexity. This is particularly appropriate when a component is analogous to a gene. Uh, there's an argument for that in the paper. But what do we mean by ongoing growth? The diversity of adaptive components is necessarily bounded in artificial systems by unavoidable physical limits such as computer memory, and in nature again by physical limits such as number of atoms. So a more precise notion than unbounded diversity is needed. Ackley's concept of indefinite scalability provides this. The key criteria for indefinite scalability is that should an upward bound be reached, increasing the values of physical limitations, such as available matter, population size or memory, should enable an unbounded sequence of greater upper bounds to be achieved, after sufficient increases in limitations. In step 4 then, the aim is to demonstrate a sequence of greater upper bounds on diversity, on increasing values of physical limitations, that increases without any known bound, qualifying the extent, for example the number of generations or value of physical limitations, to which this has been established. This also leads to our fourth challenge, developing more evolutionary systems that exhibit ongoing growth in complexity, as set out here. Although one system has already exhibited indefinite scalability in diversity and complexity, analysis of it revealed the complexity scaled only logarithmically, with the lower of maximum population size and maximum number of neurons per individual. The evolution of artefacts and behaviours of much greater complexity, for example comparable to those in nature, within feasible timescales, will almost certainly require a higher order of complexity scaling. That leads to our fifth challenge, achieving a higher order of complexity growth within a system exhibiting definite scalability complexity. This can be considered a grand challenge for Tokyo Type 1 open-ended evolution. Promising approaches to this grand challenge include also achieving one or more of the other Tokyo types of open-ended evolution. Indeed, this can be seen as one answer to why these other types of open-ended evolution are important, providing a unified view of open-ended evolution. I'll now summarise with a focus on the five challenges. This work brings us together five methods of analysis to form a five-step procedure for testing for Tokyo Type 1 open-ended evolution, with a clear rationale for each step. It also presents five challenges in open-ended evolution and their corresponding tests. The first being to develop more autonomous systems that exhibit unbounded total cumulative evolutionary activity at step one. Challenge two, develop more autonomous systems that demonstrate unbounded evolutionary activity dynamics using component normalized evolutionary activity statistics. That was steps two and three. Challenge three, develop the first autonomous system to do so in which long evolutionary sequences of evolve artifacts or behaviours and the evolution of more complex artifacts and behaviours can be seen, evidenced by phenotypes rather than just by metrics. Challenge 4. Develop more evolutionary systems that exhibit ongoing growth in complexity. That's York Type 2 open-end evolution, step 4. And 5. Develop the first such system to achieve a higher order of complexity growth. That was step 5. Lastly, and I'd be very interested to know what others think about this, uh, I think that perhaps there's a unified view of open-end evolution, uh, in which Tokyo Type 1 open-end evolution is seen as a necessary foundation for Tokyo Types 2, 3 and 4, and Tokyo Types 2, 3, 4 are seen as a means to achieve a higher order of complexity growth within Tokyo Type 1 open-end evolution.